I have always wanted to be able to begin this way. Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. (laughs) Now let me explain which scripture and how it has been fulfilled. When Peter spoke on the day of Pentecost, he reached back to the prophet Joel, where he says that your old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions. I have this recurring dream that I'm to speak someplace significant. And before I go up to speak, there's not a working toilet in the place. Here I thought it was simply, you know, a a phobia, a fear. I never knew it was divine revelation before. (laughs) But this old man has dream dreams. (laughs) And Adam Tice, Naomi Tice, if you ever lead that song again before I am speaking, I'm taking my name off the program. Thank you. (laughs) For those of you who missed... The the, uh, gathering last night, we learned a new song. Huh? There were seven constipated men in the Bible. And who knew that they would all find relief at the same time and create havoc for our maintenance staff? (sighs) Jeff, thanks for arranging for that. Um, Juan, thank you for what you have done this morning and the sacred space you created through word and as a place that the spirit could inhabit and move among us through sacrament. Uh, This week for me, has just been phenomenal. Uh, And I feel like I'm here uh, just simply standing on the shoulders of those who've come before. And they've made a mighty good foundation. So thank you to all of you who have spoken. I thought about trying to interject this piece and this piece and this piece as a way of summing up. And I realized I would have spent the entire time because I couldn't edit out those things that were extraneous, because I found little extraneous in this week. So I simply want to acknowledge that I seek to build where others have already started. I also want to acknowledge, while I'm not Korean, I am Pennsylvania Dutch. And we know something about shame also. We can, we can do that one real well, let me tell you. Do you know something about that, Sarah? (laughs) Yeah, I thought you did. Anyway, um, scribes fit for the kingdom of heaven. I imagine most of us here who are experiencing a call to ministry, whether that happened at an early age or happened at a later time in life, never really wanted to be called a scribe. I mean, the scribes get lots of bad press in the Gospels. They're they're always paired, or almost always paired with the Pharisees. And they become an easy, they become easy whipping boys. And this is time, this is a good moment to to be gender specific. uh, Because they're always messing up. Uh, In fact, maybe if they'd been more gender inclusive, they wouldn't have messed up so much. But there is this one moment where the scribes get a really good billing, but they get a new job description. You see, the role of the scribe was to preserve and pass on tradition, to interpret, to draw up legal documents and understandings based on the tradition. But Jesus, in the midst of his parables on the kingdom, declares that every scribe who is fit for the kingdom of heaven 
is like the householder who, who brings out of their storehouse that which is old and that which is new. And I, there's the rub for those of us who are scribes today. What is the balance between that which is old, the preservation and guarding of that which is sacred tradition and vital, and that which is new, bringing that tradition into conversation with the contexts and moments in which we are finding ourselves? What is the spirit breathing and challenging and inviting? And what is the tradition saying, wait, don't go there. You are giving up something sacred. And I want to suggest, at least in our minds, that in this moment of momentous squaring off and division, we do well, rather than the other names that we attach to one another, and other ways we are dismissive, to ask the question, huh, what is this person seeking to preserve of the tradition? And what is this person seeking to understand of the newness? It won't change the fact that there are differences, but it may reframe the fact that we will see each other as those who are seeking to be responsive to what God has done, is doing, and will do. So, I won't be coming back to that text, it's not, but it is, it is that task that we're going to be looking at here. And we'll be doing it in a framing of a, you might call it a methodology, although that's probably a stretch, of hearing humility, hermeneutics, and hope. First, uh, First, I want my little thing. Here we go. Oh, there it is, the text. Thank you. Okay, hearing. I'm going to share with you first a bit of my journey. We've been hearing from new Anabaptist voices that that language wasn't around in the fall of 1976 when I, who came out of a mainline Protestant tradition, frustrated and... Uh, ready to abandon the Christian faith over the inability of the church to answer questions of violence. You see, the dominant two realities of my growing up years in the larger world were the war in Vietnam and the civil rights movement. The first one impacted me more than the second. I went to a high school where there were out of a class of 450, six African-American students and maybe six national students who would come for a year and study there and go back. And we were always happy on the soccer team that they came. Um, so the civil rights movement, while it stirred us, and in fact, when I thought about my own sense of call to ministry and why ministry was worthwhile, I realized most of the images that shaped me were those who were public preachers and pastors and leaders. Martin Luther King, Ralph, Ralph Abernathy, C.T. Vivian, the Brothers Berrigan, and Richard McSorley, that it was these who stirred me. But as I said, the tradition in which I grew up deeply rooted in just war. I was part of a congregation, actually, that almost left our denomination when the denomination came out against the war in Southeast Asia. Yet I was nurtured in faith. There were good people in that place. That's another story for another day to mine that out. But in the fall of 76, through a friendship, I'd spent a year in a work-study program, there was a guy taking a year off from Goshen College. Jim Brenneman happens to be his name. <laughs> he was already, I guess, worried about admissions levels and numbers at Goshen College. 
he got me to come. And I showed up at Goshen College and all of a sudden came into this conversation that had been going on for nearly 500 years about following Jesus in the way of nonviolence. I was astounded. I must be in the place where all Christian Democrats live. <laughs> well, there were some things that I found out later. Uh, then I took a course with J.R. Br- I was a science major. Unfortunately, I spent most of my time on the stage, which, let me tell you, is the best preparation for ministry. <laughs> and the work of improvisation. But then I took a course with J.R. Burkholder. I don't know if J.R. will ever be memorialized as one of the great evangelists in the Mennonite Church, but I was certainly evangelized in his classes. And I took one after another after another. Met Dan Schrock, both on a dorm floor and in one of those classes. And I discovered that there really was one true church without spot, blemish, or wrinkle. <laughs> I met a daughter of that church, and we were married. That church offered me a job. My first boss was June Alleman Yoder. Best supervisor you could possibly have, especially at break time. (laughs) And lo and behold, one thing led to another. And a call to ministry which I had experienced early on, but now had, had come to set aside. You see, by the end of my freshman year of college, I had blown it so bad academically, I was afraid that the possibility of a career in medicine was out. And I had blown it so badly morally that I was certain that a career in ministry was out. So at 18 and a half, 19, 19 and a half, life's options seemed closed. And I arrived at Goshen College. And this clannish people, you know what I knew about Mennonites from growing up? And I grew up in Bucks County, Percocy. I could go two hours away from Percocy and people had never heard of it. I, I end up in the middle of Indiana and people say, oh yeah, sure, I've got a cousin in Percocy. <laughs> and furthermore, I had the last name Miller, so I spent the first two weeks in the cafeteria explaining, no, I'm not your cousin. Anyway, I entered this community, and in short time, I became Anabaptist enough that no longer the mainline understanding I had of call to ministry, that was you sort of announced you're going to seminary, you're going to get your church, and you're going to run your church's programs. No, it had to be discerned in community. But something else was happening in the Mennonite church at that time. It was called charismatic renewal. And I was also touched by that. And because of that, you couldn't say that you were testing a call to ministry. The Lord had to reveal it. (laughs) My wife Mary and I became youth sponsors. And one day I got a call from the pastor saying they would like to meet with me. The elders and the pastor wanted to meet with me. (laughs) I said, Mary, what does it mean in a Mennonite church when the pastor and elders want to meet with you? I have no idea. We met. And they wanted to know if I had ever considered a call to ministry. So, community and the Spirit told them, what do you do at that point? But apply to AMBS. Got that? What do you do at that point? You apply to AMBS. Thank you. It's a little bit like Samuel saying, here am I, Lord. Just the same thing, you just fill out the form now. So, then some things happened where I discovered it wasn't without spot, blemish, or wrinkle. 
do we do? Because those who seem spotted and blemished and wrinkled are so unnerving to this church that I loved so much. At least the one in my mind that I loved so much. So, long journey, places I've been has been have been named. Fall of 2009, I arrive here and begin teaching. I had the great joy of joining those who had been my teachers, Ben Olenberger, Mary Schertz, Ted and Gail Gerber Kuntz, others who I knew who I hadn't studied with, Daniel Scapani, Walter Sawatsky, others. And it was like, wow, am I really here? And I was the youngest <laughs> member of the faculty. There are now six who are younger than I am. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that first year was really hard, and I was amazed. I came back out of pastoral ministry to this community of scholarship and learning, and I found, I discovered that my colleagues mumbled. I'd sit in faculty meetings, and it's like these erudite scholars. Those who had taught me didn't raise their voice loud enough to be heard. My students were so soft-spoken. I would say, would you repeat your question, please? Would you please repeat your question? Would you repeat your question? Didn't help much. I guess it was my humility. Humility. I came back for my second year, and lo and behold, over the summer, my colleagues and faculty had stopped mumbling. They must have spent all summer like Democritus in the shore, with a mouthful of stones learning to talk. <laughs> Students found their voices. And my health insurance paid for this. Not that their mumbling and soft-spoken had anything to do with me, huh? <laughs> the problem's always out there. Fix them. The first task before us is hearing. And I want to tell you about four hearing aids that I have been given that were far more effective than this one, and this one's pretty darn good. So don't make any wrinkling noises with your papers because it drives me insane. <laughs> and do not let Janine Birchie Johnson go to the desk cant. <laughs> <laughs> Judy's story. In the middle of 1980s, I was director of the voluntary service program for Mennonite Board of Missions. And you know, I've been drinking in Anabaptism and how we watch over one another. Accountability. These things became... They, they were not part of the tradition I was from. It was a deeply live and let live kind of thing. The call to discipleship, uh, when Bonhoeffer wrote about Chief Grace, I was sure he had seen my background. And I was meeting with Judy, who was a VSer. We were meeting over lunch in a public place. And I knew that Judy had become involved in a dating relationship. And that was okay. Uh, we'd become liberal in VS by those days. But I knew the person in that relationship, that relationship was an anything but recovering alcoholic. And I was deeply concerned. What would this mean for her? How could she wasn't going to be a healthy relationship. So we covered the things we were supposed to cover in, in our meeting, and I put my pen down, and I, in my was careful, caring, trying not to be hierarchical, all those things, just said, Judy, I, uh, I know about the relationship, and I, I just like to talk with you a little bit about it. I have questions if this is a very, going to be a very healthy relationship. 
At that moment, her eyes flashed with fury. Her fist came down on the table, and she said, Healthy relationships... I'll tell you about healthy relationships. Healthy relationships were taken out behind the barn by my uncle and cousins. And I won't repeat the deleted expletive that followed in terms of what they did to her. And she said, and then it was my responsibility to forgive them and to keep quiet, lest their reputations be harmed. Now, when her fist hit the table, my coffee cup jumped about that far off the table. A quick glance over my shoulder indicated that I was not imagining things. Every eye in the place was indeed on us. And where I came from, you didn't talk about such things. And if you did talk about them, you certainly didn't talk about them out loud in a public place. And I lost my composure. <laughs> I still haven't gotten it back. You see, Judy became a hearing aid to me. Because all of a sudden, in the moment, what became clear was all of the things that in my life had conspired to bless and release and open doors, family, church, school, local government, every one of these said, go, you can do it. Go, we'll give you opportunities. Every one of these had functioned exactly the opposite in her experience. And now the question became, would I let there be batteries in this hearing aid or would I need to turn it off to silence? I don't know why Judy trusted me. She extended a gift of grace. I was in a position of power. I was male. I represented the church. I was an ally with all of these things. Yet she still took the risk. When I returned to pastoral ministry a couple years later and served in a co-pastorate, after two years I sat down and took an accounting at one point found I was spending a fourth of my time as a pastor working with survivors of abuse. And except for one of them, the others had all been raised in Christian families, many of them Mennonite families. And how, how was this happening? They became amplifiers to my hearing aid and began to give response to preaching. I, silly me, I asked them to do that. And they did. And said, if you hear me saying things that continue to fund abuse, those kinds of things that are right 90% of the time, but in that 10%, what they do is they serve to silence and do harm, they would point those things out. We will come to a text in a little bit that I learned to read differently because of the questions they brought to me. Second was a sermon response. This isn't nearly so long of a story. This was one of those days, and you've, all of you who preach, you know what those days are like. You are really good. It's one of those days when everything is hitting on all cylinders. If you had been there, you would have shown Peter up on the day of Pentecost. <laughs> you know, his trifling, how many thousand? Come on. You know, You're good and you know it and people are coming out and greeting you at the door and they're telling you that. And then came Liz. She took my hand. She looked at me and she said, well, you blew it today. 
<clears throat> I look at her and say, do you want to say more? I'd been taking seminary classes already. <laughs> that one only cost me about $1,500 in tuition. <laughs> Worth every penny of it. Do you want to say more? Nobody ever told me that the answer could be, as a matter of fact, yes. <laughs> she said, everyone who walked in here today, off of whose backs everything had rolled, you just gave a little bit more to roll off. And everyone who came in today carrying the weight of the world, you just gave a little bit more weight. Have a good day. And she turned and she walked away. I'm like, no, you can't do that! <laughs> you can't leave me with that! And I, no, well, it's her problem. This reason, and this reason, and this reason I could dismiss her, and I fumed and I fumed. Finally, Monday, I had the courage to go back to the church, get the tape. Finally, Monday evening, I had the courage to put the tape in the tape recorder, and I listened. And damn it, she was right. I have not prepared a sermon since that she is not with me. To whom am I addressing? Whom am I comforting? Whom am I challenging? The bus ride to Decatur. I did my Doctor of Ministry at Columbia Theological Seminary. One month after 9-11, I had a class. Flew, flew down to Atlanta, Hartsfield Airport, took the MARTA, the, the, the high-speed train out as far as it went to the end of the line. And then I caught a bus from there to the seminary at Decatur. It's 9, 30, 10 o'clock on a Sunday night. I don't know my way around very well yet in Decatur. So, I, so the, when the bus opens the door, I, I sit up near the front so I can see out and hopefully see things look familiar. Everyone else gets on the bus. And I look around and I'm the whitest thing on the bus. I'm the only white one on the bus. I'm not used to being the minority on the bus. That's, that's not the world I inhabit. And I thought, okay, no problem. I will just hunker down here. I'm here to learn great theological truths. And I have had a long day of travel. Thank you. Let me be invisible. And the guy across the aisle, African-American young man, in a loud voice says, so what do you think about what's been going on? This is a month after 9-11. I didn't Ask him to clarify. I thought I knew. And I said, well, my fear, my deepest concern, is that out of our outrage and hurt and fear, we will set in motion actions that will only increase the cycles of violence and destruction. A guy from the back of the bus in a loud voice says, man, is that right? And I got my wish, I became invisible because a conversation opened up on the bus between everyone else who were African American giving this amazing social analysis of what was taking place and why 9-11 took place. And I'm sitting there kind of dumbfounded. The next morning on campus, I hunted out Will Coleman, professor of social ethics, African American scholar. And I said, Will, this happened last night. And he kind of smiled. And he said, well, you're one lucky white guy. <laughs> he said, folks who are oppressed, who have a history of oppression, understand why a 9-11 could happen. And they have a very intricate conversation going on, but those folks are also bilingual. And those folks aren't having that conversation in front of you very often. For whatever reason, you were given a gift of grace last night. They granted you their ears. They became hearing aids to me. That we Mennonites, we people of peace, who obviously were going to stand against a march to war, weren't the only ones. And ours was ideological Theirs was more sociological, understanding the dynamics. And they became my teachers on that bus ride. 
Lastly, I want you to know the trust of DuBose McLean. DuBose McLean grew up in South Texas, Anglo, in a very religious family. His father was a missionary on the Tex-Mex border, worked in a boys' school. He taught, the preacher. Bo attended the schools there. When I arrived and started pas- as a pastor in State College, Bo was a member of University Mennonite Church. But the third week there, I was there, he came up to me one day and said, Dave, can, can you and I have lunch together? I said, yeah, I'm trying to get around to everyone in the congregation. That would be great. He said, I'll treat you. And he names a place, and we met that week. And we sit down to eat, and Bo's sort of fiddling with his fork, and he sets it down. He said, I want you to know something, David. I am homosexual. And I want you to know my story. And Bo went on to tell, growing up in a very religious family where he felt loved, and he learned to love Christ in the church. Yet he said, I was never quite right. I didn't fit in like the rest of the guys at the boys' school. So he said, I learned to trade as a printer, and I went to work for our denominational printing house as a printer. I still didn't fit in. Someone gave me the name of a therapist in a church counseling center who worked with me. I noticed his one hand trembled a bit, and he apologized. He said that started after, after several treatments of electroshock therapy. That was part of what was going to correct me. Finally, the therapist said, Bo, this is either going to kill you or you need to get out of here. If I were you, I'd go to New York City and get lost. We don't have anything to offer you. And so Bo went to New York City to get lost. He found another printing job And he said he was printing some paper, and in it there was this ad for a new church that was starting in New York City, a metropolitan community church. And Bo showed up and became one of the founding members. An active member of the church. When he retired, his nephew was a member of University Mennonite Church, and he'd been down to visit a number of times, and the congregation had always received him well, and so he retired there. They'd received him as a member several years before I got there. Bo arrived in State College and helped found the local PFLAG chapter, parents and families of lesbian and gays. Now they simply go by PFLAG, the Now it's all of the the letters. And I don't know how many people Bo helped keep from committing suicide. I don't know how many family relationships he helped to heal. I do know that Bo did the work of Christ. And Bo extended trust to me. And I wasn't clear as a scribe. I wasn't clear on the tradition and the the old and the new. I knew I saw the work of God in him. I knew that I that Christ certainly called us to justice. Going how much further than that, I don't know. I never spoke to condemn but I never spoke to freely welcome. I sought to probably carry out a benevolent do not ask, don't tell. Yet Bo still trusted me. One Sunday morning before worship, he came up to me and said, Dave, I've been battling an eye infection all week. And he said, my eye dries out and I blink a lot. And he said, I just want to let you know why you're preaching. If you see me winking at you, I'm not making a pass. <laughs> He 
he trusted me that much. He died suddenly in a heart attack. I met at the emergency room with his nephew. Saw his body. And then following the wishes he had written up, co-led a funeral with the pastor of the Metropolitan Communities Church from New York City. And I'm like, this is what you're doing, isn't it? I don't understand. It doesn't fit my categories. <laughs> But captives are being set free. Persons who would be undergoing electroshock therapy are not doing so. Parents and children are being reconciled and set free from shame. So, I'd like you to turn in pairs. You're going to have two minutes in your pair. Each has two minutes. I want you to share in two minutes a story of someone who has been your hearing aid. Turn. Okay, I need to call you back. Sorry. We will be doing this again, I promise you, so, you know, you can keep, keep talking, you'll have the same conversation partner. When neo-Anabaptists, Anabaptists, African-American theologians, others come together on Anabaptism, almost everyone discovers that humility is among those things that have characterized this Anabaptist movement. There are some incredible expressions of humility in the Mennonite church. That's my second point. My first point, however, is that I found that Mennonites really hate to be wrong. They really, really hate to be wrong. It's almost as though their salvation depends on being right. It's almost as though grace doesn't exist. I, in fact, I often thought that Maybe, you know, it was too bad that we should have gotten uh, John Hausman. Remember the great British actor? John Hausman used to do the Smith Barney commercials. I thought we should get him to do a whole series campaign of evangelism for Mennonite Church. In the Mennonite Church, we get our salvation the old fashioned way, we earn it. <laughs> We don't believe that with our lips, in our confessions, but boy, we do in our behavior. The first time I officiated at the Lord's Supper at Mennonite Church, I, I made the stupid mistake of saying, come to this table with joy. And after... <laughs> this man came up to me afterwards and said, I've never heard the word joy used with communion before. I said, why not? Because I might be eating and drinking unworthily. And so, while we think we are being humble, what we really are saying is, we don't believe when Jesus says, I have earnestly desired to keep this Passover with you. I have earnestly desired, before I suffer, to share this. Come to this table. Because we think we get there by deserving. see it happen. It makes conversations hard between students in classes when we get on touchy issues like race and a person of color it lays themselves out, sometimes in anger, sometimes eloquently. And the white students sit there and you can see it in their eyes. I don't want to say the wrong thing. I don't want to say the wrong thing. 
What's the right thing to say? Let's go. Maybe I can quote Dr. King. What's the right thing to say? <laughs> you know, so they're sitting there struggling and they say nothing. And the student of color hears, so, I'm not even important enough. What I said is not important enough to engage. Folks, guess what? We're going to get it wrong. Do you repeat after me? We're going to get it wrong. Second, we might need to be forgiven. We might need to be forgiven. By persons of color. By women, women. in which case, case. (laughs) we will be honoring them them as as priests. You see, when I take the risk of getting it wrong, and the other person can correct me, they become my teacher. If I need to be forgiven, they become my priest. I decenter me. And here all along I thought I was being humble. I didn't want to say anything hurtful. I didn't want to do anything that made... No, I didn't. I wanted to maintain control. There have been courageous experiments among Mennonites that have changed major things in our society. CPSers went into mental health institutions during World War II and came out and changed the way this country, the way North America looked at persons who were mentally ill. They didn't go in with a grand strategy. They didn't pre-plan, oh, we have an idea. If we say no to war, they'll send us into these, then we can demonstrate to them, we've got a mission strategy here, folks. Guess what? The most effective ministry strategies are usually not pre-planned in a boardroom. They happen out of a simple act of seeking to follow Jesus. And all of a sudden Jesus says, hey, over here. And here's another chance. Oh, you think that was hard? Come here. (laughs) You're not going to do this one without my spirit. (laughs) And then we've got to start yielding to the spirit. But we've learned, we've become more sophisticated, thank God. We set up a Washington office so we can lobby. Now, I believe we should have that office as a place of bearing witness and speaking for those who have no voice. So don't hear me wrong on that. But it's not because we're going to say, look, we can produce this many signatures. It's rather, here's a demonstration plot. And all of a sudden, Cities and states that are bankrupting themselves start to say, we can't afford another prison. Is there another option? Oh, Victor Fendum reconciliation. You mean, you know something about that? And the powers come to learn, even if it's only out of their own self-interest. It's in that following after, so that we are reminded it's not because of our goodness, but what the Spirit of God gives us the grace to have happened through us. The privilege of what we did not know how to do. We received the gifts of others. I don't remember what I was going to say about that point, and I might even go up there and look. (laughs) Time's running short, and there are important things to say. The other thing about humility, and let's be clear about it, it's not about stifling positive ego development or confidence in children. You don't teach humility when the cup is already empty. Humility is learned when you think your cup is full and you know it all and you understand that you know nothing. You don't preempt confidence, awareness, capacity. Those are good things. So, conversation two. 
Again, you've got two minutes each. How has humility functioned in your experience? You may name a gift. You may name a shadow. Okay? How has humility functioned in your experience? One story. Go. One back. I'm losing control. <laughs> okay, if you could come back, please. Thank you. This is a good reason to stay for lunch. <laughs> You've got conversations you need to carry on. We are going to have a very short course, 15 minutes in missional hermeneutics. We are going to be making our way Briefly through Ephesians 1 through 3. That's not verses, that's chapters, folks. I'm teaching this the same way Millard Lind used to teach everything in the Pentateuch after Genesis 12. Okay. Hermeneutics. We have to remember and teach our congregations when we pick up the New Testament, we are picking up the documents of an illegal religion in a hostile empire. And like those folks on the bus in Atlanta, the New Testament is bilingual. And I'm not making an argument for taking New Testament Greek. That's not a bad idea. Willard, I'm sorry. I didn't... <laughs> I'll make you proud of me in a moment. Uh, but we are picking up the documents so that the speech of persons is so located in that empire that it's bilingual. It understands the speech of the dominant power of the empire and enters into conversation with it and subverts it and delegitimates it. Problem is, we live post-Constantine when the church has been allied with power, so we read these documents as though they are theological treatises speaking eternal truth that undergirds our position of controlling the society. They are all about breaking control. The greater chasm I want to suggest to you, however, I know there's a whole issue of the problem of history in biblical studies. I want to suggest to you the problem isn't history, it's social location. I happened to spend time up at Union Seminary in New York City, not known particularly as a bastion of taking the Bible real seriously and centrally. There are other seminaries that seem to do that better. However, I was with the students in the Poverty Initiative and they said, guess what we've discovered? As we move closer to the poor, all of a sudden, the Bible sounds relevant. These ancient documents are no longer so long ago and far away. They sound strikingly contemporary. That's why I say the problem is not so much a distance of years, but a distance of dollars and power. So, the book of Ephesians begins with this wonderful blessing. Uh, we're not going to get into the question of authorship. It was either written by Paul or another later apostle by the name of Paul. So, we'll settle it that way for now, okay? I, I know the arguments, and I know there's good reasons, and there are all kinds of intricate things. But for us at this point, it's immaterial. What is important is that we come up here that this... We're given this long treatise that, that Calvinists love because they find the whole doctrine of predestination laid out here. And Arminians just kind of avoid this section here because we don't know what to do with it. It talks about all this foreknowledge stuff and all this stuff and say, what does it do with our, our will and everything else? But hold on. Both. This is not a treatise about predestination. Arminians, take a deep breath. You're not threatened by it on that score. Instead, 
this is an answer to the proclamation that Caesar is Lord and that the world is held together by the genius of Caesar and that history that matters begins with the founding of Rome. So now we're saying, ha uh It goes back to before the foundation of the world. Huh. Something more significant than Rome is here. We have been, he destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ and according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, he freely bestowed on us. This has been given. You didn't have to earn this. You didn't have to buy your citizenship. You've been adopted. We have redemption through his blood. And then here, here's the, point, the key point I want us to note. With all wisdom and insight, he made known to us the mystery of his will plan according to his good pleasure he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up to unite all things in him in heaven and on earth that is throwing down the gauntlet that says Caesar holds everything together the logic and folks do you know one of the main instruments Caesar uses to unite all things hmm well war yes Fear, worship, the cross. If you have not read James Cone's Cross and the Lynching Tree, you must. James Cone holds that North American Christians will not understand the cross until they understand the lynching tree. Jesus' death was nothing unusual. It happened thousands of times. In fact... During times of revolution, it happened thousands of times in a day. They were running short on wood on which to impale people. Over 3,000 at the time of Spartacus. If we live in the first century in an imperial city, and we are approaching on one of the major roads to the city, if we are fortunate, we will be coming up to the gate of the city and we will see some posts in the ground. If we are unfortunate... There will be people impaled on those posts with the charges above their heads. Oh, so they didn't just do that to Jesus? Hmm. This is a means to say to you when you go past, if you step out of line, we have a seat reserved for you. And it's not in the business section. Well, maybe it is the business section. Anyway, we won't go there. This is how Caesar unites the empire. So, the author here... Oops, other direction. Other direction. Thank you. So, oops, sorry, we forgot one thing here. At the end of this first chapter, the apostle wants to strengthen the church. And what does he say? He offers a prayer that you may know that there's a power working in you, and God put this power to work in Christ when he raised Christ from the dead. The cross loses its finality. The cross is not the end. It is not the victory. The resurrection is the victory that says Caesar may be painful, but he's ultimately powerless. Death, which is Caesar's instrument, is not the last word, and that same power is at work within you. Only thing is, we believe that we earn our salvation secretly. We don't need to be saved. We are going to do this ourselves. Hmm, maybe some work for us to do here, folks. 
Second, wrath. I came to this study because of the complaints of survivors in our congregation. They talked about divine child abuse. You know, why is God so angry? And it's really interesting. Willard, I hope you can see from there, it's, it's, there's Greek up here. <laughs> Thank you for your teaching. And the question is, whose problem is wrath? Now, first and foremost, I want to say that the concept of the wrath of God is well attested in Scripture. What things evoke God's wrath? Abuse of the poor, forgetting the widow, the orphan, and the alien, unjust scales, unjust treatment of your laborers, all those things evoke the wrath of God. And we trivialize it as a generalized disposition. As though, gee, too bad that Jesus didn't come today because all Jesus would have had to do was give God Prozac. And then he wouldn't have had to go to the cross. God wouldn't have been so angry. But what if wrath is the human problem, not God's problem? The Greek says that we are techna fuse orges. The first edition of the NIV went so far as to translate this objects of wrath. That is a possibility. It is equally possible that what is meant here is that we are wrath filled children. So it's not that it's God's wrath directed to us. It's that we, like the rest of them, have been part of this system. We've been caught up under the spirit of the power of the air. We have been included in this, and we are wrath-filled. And the logic rhetorically here, the next line, Hode Theos, but God, who is rich in mercy. It's not God is schizophrenic. God is wrath-filled, but God is also this. Yes, God does experience wrath at injustice. But here, the the issue is that we are wrath-filled. But God, who is rich in mercy, answers this by Jesus saying, this is your instrument of wrath, huh? Okay, turn it on, use it. Now we're going to show you that it doesn't work. It's not final. It's not the last word. Control is broken. The question is, are we objects of wrath, in which case God must be appeased, or are we wrath-filled children who must be delivered from our bondage to the logic and nature of wrath? And I want to propose to you that the logic that is set forth here is this our problem of wrath that is cut loose on Jesus. Oh, wrong way. We've been given this sermon by Jonathan Edwards. I got to read in my English class when I was a junior in high school. <laughs> Sinners in the hands of an angry God holds you over the pit of hell and despises you. It was fun. Uh, Jonathan Edwards, locating the problem of wrath in God rather than in humanity, allows an easy separation of Christian ethics from soteriology. One may, in this model, easily claim to be reconciled to God that is freed from God's wrath while simultaneously dismissing the commands of Jesus to love one's enemies. One can claim to be saved by the blood of the Lamb while preparing to shed the blood of one's fellow human beings. If, however, the cross stands as remedy not to God's wrath but our own, then such separation is untenable. To deny Christ's remedy to our wrath is to deny the saving power of the cross. We are being saved from our wrath and its logic and the way it infects everything. So now we are told, as this argument goes on, 
that what God has done is broken down the wall of hostility between us. This is between Jew and Greek. I want to say, talk about this just for a moment. It had just hit me recently, and I went back. There was this thing that Jews were taught, male Jews were taught to pray daily called the 18 Benedictions. I've been able to document it goes back at least to the time of the Council of Jamnia. Other reports say, no, it goes back already to the time of Ezra, which would mean the Jews of the New Testament would be familiar with this. Including in this 18 benedictions that males are to pray every day is that I thank God that I was not born a Gentile, a slave, or a woman. The reason I thank that is because as a male, I have extra requirements in the law, and God blesses me and gives me more rules than they have. That's what the apology would say. Do you understand what's happening here? He's saying, the wall of hostilities can come down. But good, devout Jews who are part of this church daily have been rehearsing their formative practices. I thank you, God, that I was not born Gentile. I was not born a slave. I was not born a woman. I was not, I was not born, I was not born, I was not born. And for further evidence that that was contemporary with this moment, I submit the evidence of Paul's words in Galatians. There is therefore neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. Paul answers each of those three benedictions and silences them. You are not to be formed by that mentality because it deforms you. And it deforms the people of God and the reconciling work. We're running short on time here. and Jules getting nervous. (laughs) But I got three and a half minutes. So, we're not going to have a conversation about the hostility between us Instead, you're going to see my grandson. Okay, what you don't see up there is where Paul goes from here. After we learn that there's this new body, this new person created by this reconciling work, right? Then we are told what is the mission of the church. Ephesians 3.10, what is it? Oh, man. That's going to be a memory verse. To make known the manifold wisdom of God to the powers and principalities. According to the book of Ephesians, the only witness the church has is its unity and its reconciliation. That is it. The, we don't overcome the powers by getting more votes, getting somebody else elected. We do get together because, see, the, the powers through the cross can pacify, but it cannot reconcile. The powers don't know how to do that because the powers are all about doing things via power. And instead, he says, therefore it is given to the church to make known the manifold wisdom of God when these enemies are reconciled. I weep when I read of churches leaving separating themselves for the sake of the mission. Because what is the mission? Uh, Precisely. To love those we have liturgically been formed to despise. To thank God that I am not a woman, slave, or Greek, Gentile. And if we think for a moment, well, it's only limited to those three the first century, we were told in the very beginning of this book, I hope you were paying attention, what God is doing in Christ is what? Uniting all things. Things we don't know how to unite. I don't know how to do it. I don't know the people that I love on both sides of this divide, whose lives have been a witness to me on both sides of this divide. 
But I do know this, that in a society that is spending billions of dollars on advertising of the logic and hate so that the Foxes and MSNBCs can make more money over our orge, our wrath, God is saying, I'm thinking down in Jesus, the wall of hostility. And guess what? The same power in him is in you. You don't know how to resolve this? Good. So now, my glory will be made manifest in you. It will be my work. I will accomplish this. And you may be sitting together with people, and there's still enmity there. You know it's there. So when your coworkers say, how can you go to church with those people saying, you know what? We don't know. We don't know how to fix this. But we do know this. The power of Jesus is at work within us and he has promised that that same power that raised Jesus from the dead will reconcile us. We don't have to make it happen. Jesus will do it if we will allow it. But we can't allow it by walking away from each other. We can't allow it by calling each other's names. We can't allow it by taking airs of superiority or taking out ads against one another in the paper and the press. And each one of you who's a pastor know it goes right through your heart when you see the body whom you have served the Lord's Supper to. Divided. This was an exercise in hermeneutics. This is simply those things that they teach in seminary. It has no practical use. (laughs) Except the very last thing, and there's only one way I can do this, because the last gift that the apostle gives is this. For this reason, I bow before, and I'm going to say the word father. I know there are problems with that, but understand the context. He does not say, Lord, which Caesar claims, he says, Father, there is a genetic relationship between whom? Every family on heaven and earth. I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family on heaven and earth takes its name. And then he's going to say, I pray that God is going to fill you with the love that you cannot control or contain. It's beyond your knowing. So every time you get to that place saying, we don't know how to make this work, God be praised because we're about to learn something. God be praised because this is the moment we will say, pour out your spirit upon us, O Lord. So, this is what we are left with. This is that to which we are witnesses And may God empower each of you in your congregations and those of you who may be here who are at opposite ends of the spectrum. Will you please embrace one another before you leave here today and commit yourselves to seek that power that raised Jesus from the dead and to stand in awe and wonder what will happen. Amen. To God be the glory.